Hello and welcome to the Red Rock Fantasy Basketball Podcast. My name is Josh Lloyd and you can find me on Twitter at redrock underscore b-ball. Welcome to everybody listening on the Hardwood Paroxysm Network. Uh, I do welcome if you haven't listened before and uh, make sure you're subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and leaving a review. That is always fantastic. And if you're watching on YouTube, hello, and uh, you are watching live, so feel free to tweet myself and my guest any questions that you have and my guest is once again mark roberts mark how are you going hey josh i'm doing i'm going okay is that is that the australian salutation i'm going uh, yeah I, you know what you say that and I, my brain just melts and i go i don't really know <laughs> I, 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 ask me ask me how i'm going hey josh how you going um yeah i'm going all right yeah that, that's what i'd say i'm going all right going all right yeah, right. but you got to you got to really merge those words together. You got going to right. Okay, going right. Going yeah. right. It's, all right. <laughs> it's all it's all about efficiency of syllables. You got to just get it all squished in you there as much as possible. All right, but you got to do it in two syllables. I, well, nobody's got time for the the ends of words and the starts of other words. Well, it's all going to be one one long one long word into a big you know a big forty five letter word. That's the way that we are. We roll over here. And I guess that's what makes uh, a lot of <laughs> our speech difficult to understand for some people. But hopefully you can understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Now, Mark, we had a, a podcast on Tuesday. We were talking about rotations and position battles. And because there's so much to talk about, we barely scratched the surface. So we're coming back for part two. And hopefully we cover most of the things that we need to cover in these, uh, in these position battles. But before we get into that, I had uh, a flood of people informing me how to pronounce the rookie forward from the Minnesota Timberwolves, who I uh, summarily butchered in the last podcast. And I'm going to give it a go here, and then I'd like your feedback on it, Mark, and uh, everyone else who's listening who did give me some great tips of how to do it. And here we go. And I'm, I'm quite nervous here. I'm not normally nervous pronouncing things, but here we go. Nemanja Bielica. How does that sound? Does that sound good? Does it sound like I know what I'm talking about? Uh, I thought last time that you said his name that you knew what was, you were talking about. So I'm not a good judge. Well, but, I, I'm I'm pretty, pretty happy that uh, Bielitsa sounds sounds a lot better than what yeah, I said last I believe, time. I saw some of the emails that came through, and I believe that's the correct pronunciation. Yep, Bielitsa. I'm uh, I'm professional at it now. So I think that's that's the only name in the league that I am not that I wasn't on top of, and now I'm pretty much down with everyone's name. So I'm happy with that until the next one comes up, and I have no idea what to do. But I'm happy with that now. So everybody, that's out of the way. Let me know if I uh, if I still killed it, but I think I I think I did okay. Now. Let's um let's get into these teams straight into it, Mark. Let's talk um, position battles. A couple of um people once they once they saw the first show and listened to it, they were you know, getting at, getting after me on email saying, "It's Boston. We we need to know what's happening in Boston." Um, so Don't let's we do all? it. <laughs> Let, let's do Boston because that's that is one, and that actually that actually brings me into a nice little uh, segue because the team preview podcast series is kicking off. A little bit earlier than anticipated this Friday afternoon US time with the Boston Celtics, and I'm joined by uh, uh, Austin Peters of uh, Upside and Motor and a few other sites that he writes for. He's going to be talking to me about the Boston Celtics. We're going to start in the team preview series on Friday afternoon, so look out for that. But Mark, let's talk rotation in Boston, and we've mentioned this plenty of times. That we've talked. There's basically 12 guys here who get 25 minutes a night. That's the way it sort of looks, isn't it? Yeah, they're just like Portland. There, there's like fifteen guys that would be good, either sixth to eighth man on the on the in the rotation on most good teams. So, so yep. it's not like they have horrible players. They just don't have any players that probably should be starting for really good teams. And so, there's no, they're they're not separating themselves from each other. There's no, you know, like if you look at the Heat, you can see like there are five maybe six guys that are definitely better than the rest here. You've just got a, a mass amount of guys who are about the same. Yep. That's about right. Well, let's start, let's start in the backcourt. Okay. I think that we can, I think we can be pretty certain that we're going to see Marcus Smart and Avery Bradley starting and Isaiah Thomas coming off the bench as the sixth man and about 30 minutes a piece for Smart and Bradley and maybe 26 minutes for Thomas. But in saying that, Thomas is still probably going to be the best fantasy option out of those guys because we saw it last season that he doesn't need 30 minutes. He doesn't need 32 minutes to be a really effective guy. Um, do you disagree with the way that plays out? No, I think you got the minutes about right. And and Thomas really is remarkable. Like um, per possession, he's one, you know, we talk about, or I talk about per possession a lot, but if you look at just the, the fantasy productive, 
productivity that he have on a possession basis, he's one of the top 10 players in the league. So even yep. though he's getting 25, 26, 27 minutes a game, it, uh, it doesn't matter. Like you can still, he's still going to be inside the top 100 pretty safely. I've, I've got no doubt he's, he's inside. He's probably the only Boston Celtics guy inside the top 100 at this point. The, the two rookies, Terry Rozier and RJ Hunter aren't going to play uh, very big roles. If, meaningful roles at all for even 20 team leagues i would guess you're gonna have rosier as the as the third string point guard hunter's gonna be stuck behind uh stuck behind avery bradley although hunter probably has more more pathway to a role this season than what rosier does would you say but yeah not, I, I not think much. is your logic here that sort of uh marcus smart and avery bradley are defensive guys rosier kind of fits the same mold but isn't as good but hunter Hunter is going to have a different role. Like he's going to be a shooter, and so maybe there's an opportunity for the shooter to come in and play along one side one of the defensive guys. Yeah, they don't really have anyone who's a, a designated shooter. Like Marcus Smart hit threes at a rate we didn't expect last season. Avery Bradley can get hot. Isaiah Thomas can hit threes, but RJ Hunter is a shooter, and it, it's a guy who hit threes who hits threes, and a guy who's a shooter is. is different in my mind when i say those two things they're different like isaiah thomas might hit two threes a game but he's not necessarily a shooter rj hunter is a shooter does that make sense yeah i i i'm with you there let's talk their small forward evan turner and jay crowder again both these guys could play 30 minutes i think that it's going to be turner that starts again and and crowder off the bench but crowder playing some some four as well which is is even more of a nightmare considering what we're going to talk about in the front court and both those guys again they're going to struggle to be top 100 players though but they're going to be interesting turner's a guy that if you're looking for assists at the end and all the point guards are gone which they probably are by about pick 120 you can grab evan turner in the last round and maybe get five assists out of him and watch him kill every other category but you can still get five assists out of him at that point point. and jay crowder i just i'm not a jay crowder fan yeah, I, I think that they both kind of settle into that 24 to 26, 27 minute range, you know, between yep. games missed and playing, you know, Evan Turner can play multiple positions. Jay Crowder can play multiple positions. This whole I team can play multiple positions. Exactly. You can see they've got very interchangeable pieces. I think that there's kind of the same amount of minutes for both of them, whether they start or come off the bench. And I'm with you. I don't think either of them I would be taking near the top 100. All right, now, now the, the biggest mess in Boston is the front court. Okay, uh, let me know if I miss anyone here. David Lee, Jared Salinger, Kelly Olynyk, Amir Johnson, Jonas Jurepko, Tyler Zeller. That's six six guys who all, you know, you could make a case that all of them should play 25 plus minutes. Maybe yeah. not Jurepko, but he could. He's, I, I really like Jurepko. I probably irrationally like Jurepko and, and his ability to play. But all of now those wait, guys. Do I remember right? Can he slide down to the three a little bit too? Yeah, he can. He can play three. He played a lot of three in Detroit, not so much in, in Boston, but yeah, he can play the three as well. It's not like, but they don't need a three. They've got those other two guys who, who play 30 minutes, who can play 30 minutes each there as well. That's the problem. Yeah. Do you think now, Perry, who, quickly, do you think Perry yeah. Jones makes the team? No, I don't. Do you? Yeah, it's crazy, but I mean, I thought they traded him and they were going to give him a nice opportunity, but there's just not a roster spot for him, I don't no, think. That's 16 guys, um, unless they do a two-for-one and, and trade trade him away. That, that's what they're going to have to Otherwise, he's gone. There's no way he makes a, makes a team out of over any of these other guys. And there's also Jordan Mickey they've got as well, their second-round draft choice who signed for the highest second-round contract of all time. So he's another and, big uh, man who's going to sit there. Yeah, he's not going to play this year, I doubt. No, no. He's one of the guys I like the best of, of those oh, rotations. Guys. I reckon he's really, really... If, he's one of those guys, you give him minutes, and I think that he'd be a great fantasy guy. But yeah. it's going to open up next season when Salinger hits restricted free agency, when David Lee becomes an unrestricted free agent, when Tyler Zeller hits restricted free agency. Things are going to open up, hopefully, and, and that might allow um, Mickey to get some minutes. Now, starters, I'm going to go out there on a limb, and I'm going to say that they start Salinger and Amir Johnson at the four and five. I don't... Mm -hmm. I'm not big on David Lee at all. No, yeah. So I, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> no, I nobody no does. Idea. Nobody has any idea. And I think it. I could see Brad Stevens changing it. You know what I mean for a matchup based yep. sort of thing. So I guess what you're saying though is you think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you think Solinger is going to get fantasy relevant minutes. Whether I think he's, he's going to get every game. Yeah, I think he's going to get 27 minutes, 20, 27 ish minutes a night would be my guess with him. And he'll, that'll he, probably be highest uh, with uh, Amir Johnson out of those front court guys. 
But he's getting 27 minutes a game. He's a guy that's approaching the, the top 100. He's a guy yeah. that you would want to draft. Definitely, because points, rebounds, and he hits threes. He's he is a fantasy-friendly guy. Now, Amir Johnson, not so much, but he can hit threes, and, and he can block shots, and he can get good field goal percentage, and he's not a horrible free throw shooter. But out of those two, if they played the same minutes, I'd prefer Solinger. Yeah, that makes sense. David Lee, um, I'd, I'd leave alone. Really? Yeah, no, he's he's not he's not for me. I I don't think that he's yeah, complete drop off. Like okay, I I used to like David Lee a lot, but I don't. I think his drop off last year was not injury related. It was it was David Lee related, and 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 Draymond Green related as well. But it wasn't it wasn't. You know, we didn't know how good Draymond Green was going to be at the start of the season. David Lee lost his job because he wasn't good. Not because he was injured, not because Draymond Green had been playing out of his brain because he hadn't at that point. Lee lost his job because he wasn't good anymore. And I just don't see why Boston, I know they brought him in, but he's in there basically as a a trade ship, a a big contract, clear off the books, all that sort of stuff. Not necessarily to take minutes away from a guy like, they want to see what Solinger can do before they give him a restricted free agency tender or decide to match a contract. They don't want to go, yeah, let's play David Lee for a year, get the seventh seed, and then don't know what we've got with Solinger. That doesn't make sense to me, especially when their skill sets and their ability is not massively different. Yeah, you could say Lee is maybe a better player than than Sullinger. He is in some areas, but he's he's worse in others. And I would rather I would rather get Sullinger out there. Maybe I'm yeah. approaching this from the wrong way. Well I can see that. The the problem is Sullinger's never been in shape yet in the NBA. That's true. Um but that that's very dependent. If if he's if he's in shape and, and committed and, and ready to go, then that's a, a different story. If he's not, then by all means, yeah. City's asked yeah. on the bench. And so who do you see dropping there. out of the rotation? Because they can't play six guys. If you see him playing Solinger, Amir Johnson as sort of the, the two primary options, who's who's the guy that could be getting minutes but is not going to get any? I think I think Jarepko is going to going to drop down a little bit, and I, I, I think there's definitely that. I think there's definitely a trade in the works. And they've when they signed re-signed Jarepko, they were like, we are going to clear minutes for you at some point, and it's going to involve one of these front court guys, whether it's Solinger, whether it's Lee. I think that someone's going to clear out there to give to give Jurepko you know, back to 20 minutes. I could see them flipping Lee, like playing him at the beginning of the season and then yep. uh, and flipping him. What do you think about Zeller and Olenek? Do you think they both sort of fall out of the rotation? Um, I, I really like Olenek. I think that Olenek can be a, a good player. Uh, Zeller, he's okay, but he's never going to be... Uh, he's probably never going to be good. He's probably going to be average. Um, whereas Linux could become good, and that's why I prefer him. Uh, but I don't. Yeah, I, I see them dropping down considerably. They not playing twenty minutes each. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it, all, my, all, uh, I guess the other perspective I would I would give on the Celtics. I think that they could. I think that they could try to play the the guys that I projected for the most minutes are Johnson, Mir Johnson, who seems like we have some consensus on, and and would make yep. sense. They brought him in as a free agent. They're probably going to play him. Uh, fairly big minutes, and for Boston that means like 26, 27 minutes a game. Yep. And he's not a beacon of health either. Like he could definitely no, get hurt. He, he said those like ongoing. We're talking like Taj Gibson, like ankle injuries, where it is going to yeah. bother him for, forever, basically. Yeah, but he, you know, like you said, solid rebounder, solid block shot guy. I see David Lee getting minutes. I don't know exactly what the plan is. If uh, if Solinger can get in shape, I kind of see him as the other guy that gets some minutes, and then I think those other three guys have to drop off for now. Yep, I think I think that's got to be the way that, that it goes down. But all in all, they're one of the oddest teams to try and project what's happening. Um, so the other team, you, uh, I mean, so you're drafting Isaiah Thomas. You're okay yep. with him, kind of no matter what the role is. He's going to get some yep. minutes. And he's going to be good. He probably lead the league. He'll probably lead the team in scoring. Would be my guess. Yeah, I would say so. Would you guess and, so? Just and three, an three pointers, probably assists Maybe as assists. well. <laughs> I, I would, uh, I would say it, so. Is there another guy that you feel pretty comfortable drafting on the team? No, no. Everyone else is like, I'm taking a risk at a pick 120 plus. Yeah. Not a risk. I'm taking a flyer. Yeah, Bradley, Smart, Solinger, they're the sort of guys. Yeah, I'd even have a look at David Lee to, towards the end, but they're guys that he would be after those other players. But I wouldn't pick them inside the top 100. The only guy I would, probably the first guy I would take a flyer on, and it's probably still outside the top 100, is Marcus Smart. Just to yep. sort of see, you know, the upside is there, I guess, because he's an unknown. We don't know what year two is going to look like for the guy. You know he's going to get a lot of steals. 
you know, in most leagues, he's just going to chuck enough three pointers that he's going to get value in that category. Um, he's a point guard, so he's going to get some assists. So I, I think he has sort of the upside. He's going to get the minutes. You, you feel at least comfortable that Marcus Smart is going to get around 30 minutes a game now. So he'd probably be my first flyer off the bench. And I'm staying, I'm probably staying away from that front court as much as I can. Yeah, I, I'm totally with that. Now, if there's one of those guys that could could end up as a top 50 guy, it's smart because he could, you know, just all of a sudden you know, start to really explode and become a, a more lethal you know, sh- shooter from deep and become more aggressive. And he's that guy who could be, you know, 14, 5, and 5 with, with two steals and two threes. That's mm-hmm. best case, but that's a top 50 sort of number. So that's that's something that could happen. So he, he's definitely that first guy you want to take a risk on outside outside that top 100 because he has the ability to go high. Well, and I think that's uh, a good point because like if you look at Solinger's best case scenario or Amir Johnson or David Lee, it, it's sort of like there's not much of a best case scenario. It's just yep. we kind of know what they're going to be. They're going to play limited minutes. They're going to get, what, 12 and 7 rebounds, 12.7 rebounds, something like that. And, uh, right. There's just no upside there. No, exactly. And that's something that we, we've, we mentioned a lot on the last podcast is looking at at you know, ceilings and, and values and where you know, it's all about, we talk about taking Miritich. If you're picking up a pick 40, that's great. He might be the 40th best player, but there's no upside there in, in doing it. Mm-hmm. The other one I had uh, had people asking me about was, um, I had a couple actually, uh, the Philadelphia 76ers had uh, Rod sending me uh, an email asking me who's going to be their starting point guard. Is it going to be Tony Roden or is it going to be Isaiah Cannon? And at shooting guard, could Roten play there? Will Hollis Thompson play the bulk of the minutes? Or will uh, Source Castillo get uh, a big chunk of minutes at shooting guard? Unfortunately, Mark, I tend to think it's going to be Tony Roten starting, and that really, really hurts me. I like Isaiah Cannon a lot. I still, But Cannon's a guy... He's, Cannon's in, in, a, in a role or a guy similar to Isaiah Thomas to me where he doesn't need 30 minutes. He can get Mm-mm. play 24 minutes and hit two threes and get 13 points and have three and a half, four assists and still be valuable in 24 minutes. Whereas Tony Roten, we know he's going to accumulate numbers. He's also going to destroy your percentages. So he's a very, a very situational type fit guy. And I feel sorry for you if you also count turnovers because he's going to kill kill it in that area as well. How do you see it playing out in the backcourt? So, I mean, the, the case against Tony Roten is sort of, well, there's a couple. Uh, obviously, you have some bias against him. But first of all, he's coming off a pretty serious injury. That happened yep. in the middle of the season. Sort of towards the beginning, but it's not like it happened last off season or the season before. He hasn't had a full season of recovery. He hasn't so, played since since you know, having a partial tear of his ACL. Look, he hasn't come back at all. He's, yeah, uh, I could see them going slow with that. I mean, think about Jason Richardson's recovery. Tony Roten, you know, when Sam Hinky looks at Tony Roten with like his computer brain, he's not thinking about like this is going to be part of our long term future. I'd so, hope not. He's not. He doesn't fit the timetable. Like if you look at Joel Embiid and Nerlens Noel and Joel Hill Okafor's, when they're going to be, if they're going to get there, if they're going to be top guys in the league, they're leading them to a championship, which is I think how Sam Hinkie thinks. Tony Roten's going to be not good enough and too old to be there. So you know he's not a long term piece of the future. At the same time, I don't think that they have any urgency to play him. Um, with all that said, I still kind of agree with you. I think he gets the majority of the minutes at point guard, but I think that's sort of in like the 27 minute range, not in like the 35 minute range. And I yep. think that gives enough time for Cannon, like you said, sort of like an Isaiah Thomas light player in 25 minutes, he can still be close to the top 100. Yeah, he gets look, 25, it, it, 26. And then when he's going well, you know, and gets into the 30 minute range, he, he'll be a useful player in standard. Yes. Yeah. And, and he's a great streaming threes guy. You can get two or three yeah. threes out of him per game, and that's Absolutely. that can be really, really useful. Um, and I think we both agree that Nick Stauskas will be the starting shooting guard. I think so. I mean, I've never, I, I have no evidence that he's a good NBA player. No, no one does. No, no one. <laughs> he's, he's a really nice guy. I, I, yeah, I, I, I spoke to him at summer league. He was a nice guy. He was friendly, but that doesn't mean anything. He could he could be terrible. He could, he could also be great. He, could, he was in a terrible situation in Sacramento. He's not in a great one in Philadelphia, but he's actually going to have an opportunity to 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 grow and and develop with some guys. So I, I'm happy I taking a risk on him. With you, I think I think he's in a great situation in Philadelphia. Okay. I know that they don't win a lot of games, but I think I I think Brett Brown is an excellent coach. I think I, that, I agree with that. 
I think that organization is committed to like player development and structure and, and they've got like, if you look at the differences between Sacramento, which is a poorly run organization and Philadelphia, which I think is a well run organization, like they're on the cutting edge of all the player development type things. I think that's a perfect place for Nick Scouse to, to kind of try to revive his career. Not that it totally needs to be revived. He's only been in the, the league one year, but uh, it's such a better situation than Sacramento for him. That's the whole, that's sort of the only reason I would think about drafting him. Yeah, look, it's just because he's in such a good situation. I've got no issues with Philadelphia, the organization. I think they are really well run. Brett Brown is, is a fantastic coach. I'm all behind what they're doing. My my point was is there's not a huge amount of talent around him. And yep. as a guy who's who's a shooter and not necessarily a creator, that might not be a good situation for him when Tony Roden's hogging the ball and not giving <laughs> it off to people. Yeah, you know, when Stauskas is relying on someone who who can create space and Roden's not necessarily that guy. And even if he does, he's not necessarily passing it in the best situation. So that's that's more my concern there. Not the coaching, not the not the organization, not the hierarchy, anything like that. It's more like the on court other guys yeah. in the backcourt well, that are with you. That's true. But if you think about um you remember when Michael Carter Williams was traded and Sam Hinkie basically said, I need a point guard who can shoot. Yep. Uh you know, Tony Roten and Michael Carter Williams are are sort of interchangeable in my mind. Tony Roten yep. is a worse version of Michael Carter Williams, but they're similar players. And so you can see I could see how Brett Brown would want to put out Isaiah Cannon, who can shoot, Nick, Nick Scousis, who can shoot, Robert Covington, who can shoot, and then put Okafor. If you've got to play Okafor, who can't shoot, and Noel, who can't shoot, you've got to have three shooters around him. That's right. And, and I could see him going with those three as, as sort of their core lineup, whether that's off the bench. That, that's the way that I would like him to do it. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Oh, that, you know, Cannon, Stauskas, Covington would be the ideal one, two, three. And then Noel and Okafor, obviously. And then bringing guys like Jeremy Grant off the bench as, as a defensive three and four. Uh, and Roten as a six man type. I'm, I'm fine with that. But that, that's how, that's obviously, that's how we both think it's going to play out. Let's talk um, Indiana and their front court, which was decimated by trades, by free agency. Um, they lost Roy Hibbert, Larry traded Bird. him to the Lakers. <laughs> Larry Bird's going to suit up, and he's going to start. He's going to start bombing threes from down there. So they're going to need something. Their uh, their front court is manned by the likes of Jordan Hill, Jan Mahimi, Lavoy Allen, Miles Turner, and uh, and your boy Shane Whittington uh, in there as well. Who is um going to start, and who's going to get the fantasy minutes? I think I think it's going to be Miles Turner and Jordan Hill. Do you see it a different way? I, I mean, haven't isn't everything we've heard is Paul George is the new power forward there? And then who plays at the three? It's not like they have another great option for the three. Solomon Hill didn't exactly inspire a lot of confidence in anyone last year. Yeah, I mean, I, that's that's probably who it is. I, I don't know if you run sort of like, if you're trying to get CJ Miles at the three a little bit and maybe in a small lineup, you get Stucky out there. I don't know what they're going to do. I don't sort of understand this uh, new philosophy that Larry Bird has come out with and just basically said, hey, we want to play small ball. But I... I guess I trust them to the point where I say, I think a lot of the power forward minutes are going to go to Paul George. Like if he plays 36 minutes, I, I kind of expect 24 of those to be a power forward. Interesting. Okay. So out of those front court guys, is there anyone that's worth it in fan, in standard leagues or, or who, who is the guy that is the most valuable? Is it, is it here? Like I love what Turner can do. He's he, the one thing, yeah, the mean, best. We know, thing what, he, we know what Jordan Hill is. Like, yeah, we, like, yeah exactly. You can put on your team, like if you're in a head to head matchup and you need blocks and rebounds for the last half of the yeah. week and you don't 12, expect 12 and 10, one, one and a half blocks. And that's it. That's Jordan Hill. Yeah. And that's like best case scenario, I think. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think Jan Mahimni still gets some minutes. Like, I don't think Jordan Hill plays a ton of minutes. He's just not that good. But it, it, even if he gets minutes, we know exactly what he is. Like you said, you just outlined his best case scenario. Probably yep. his more likely scenario is is ten seven and a half in one block. So yep. if you need to pick up rebounds and blocks at the end of the week and you pick him up, that's fine. But he's Miles Turner is the only guy that has any intrigue, sort of just because we haven't seen him play in the NBA. He projects out well. I mean, you and I talked about that on our rookie podcast. Who knows if he gets the minutes? But he's the only guy that I'm kind of willing to take a chance on. He's got a unique skill set for that front court as well, in that he hits free throws. Nobody else does. He blocks shots at a really high rate, and he hits threes as well. And we saw him do all that in summer league and just look completely dominant in that situation. And that's fine in summer league. And if you're good, you should dominate. And he did, and that's all you can ask from him. It's more with if you're good and you, and you suck, that's a problem. 
But if you're good and you dominate, you should, and that, that's great. And it's not going to translate exactly, but he does have that that interesting skill set. A guy who I find interesting in that front court as well, who's probably not going to factor much, is Lavoy Allen. He's always been a guy that when he plays, he can do Jordan Hill sort of things, but even in less minutes than Jordan Hill, um, he couldn't be. He can be ten points, ten rebounds, two blocks in eighteen minutes in, in a you know on a good night. It, the problem is, it just doesn't happen enough. Um, and he was a guy that I was you know, really excited about when um, when he was at Philadelphia at that trade deadline when they were uh, when they traded Thad Young. I was rubbing my hands together. It's Lavoy Allen time. He's going to play thirty five minutes and he's going to get big numbers. And then he ended up in Indiana as well, and that killed his value. So he's an, he's another guy to keep in mind in mind there for deep leagues. But he's he is behind Hill and Mahinmi and uh, and Miles Turner at this point. I would say that uh, with pretty much confidence. Yeah. New York, the Knicks. We both we both like Chris Stapps. There's a. I mean, that's but, the only real real question here: is does he play minute? I, does he play I enough to be relevant? You know that Carmelo Anthony is going to get minutes. You know Aaron Aflo is going to get minutes. You know Robin Lopez is going to get minutes. You know Jose Calderon is going to get a like a a majority share of the point guard minutes. I don't know that it's going to be thirty five, but it might be twenty eight. Twenty eight. Yeah. Yeah, Langston Galloway is going to play a little bit. Some of those other guys in the front court are going to affect. But they sort of all don't matter to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, yep. we know what Robin Lopez is. You're going to draft him. Maybe you draft Aaron Aflow. You're probably not drafting Derek Williams or Kyle O'Quinn uh, in a standard league. Maybe, ho- like, we, those guys are all – we have so much uh, data on them. We know what they are. The only, the only question is, does uh, Porzingis fit into the rotation or not? The, the problem I have – not the problem. The, the only impact that Derek Williams or Kylo Quinn will have in standard leagues is do they play too much to limit Porzingis' impact? Impact, like that, and that that's Derek Williams is just not good. Like he's he's just not good, and he's not he, to me. He's not even worth taking a flyer on in standard leagues. Kylo Quinn, I can see because he can do some weird things. He can hit free throws, not yeah. bad. He can hit some threes. He block shots like an animal. He can go out there and get two blocks in twenty minutes. And if he plays thirty minutes, it's almost a guaranteed two blocks. He can get some rebounds. He's got a he's got a really unique skill set. Pretty good passer. He he is. He's a. I think he's a real. I think he's a really good player. I really liked what he did in Orlando a couple of seasons ago. Until last season, he was just inexplicably buried on their on their depth chart and in their rotation. Thanks, Jacques Vaughn. But he's not going to start. Porzingis. We hear these whispers of Phil wants to limit him to twenty minutes, and that means we don't want anything to do with him in fantasy in do fantasy you leagues. Phil? No, I don't. No, like <laughs> no, I don't. I don't believe anything that he says in that regard. I think that they. It's not like Porzingis. Like, yes, he's seven foot eleven. He's he weighs eighty four pounds. That's fine. We know that. We know he's tall. But you know what? He's been playing in professional leagues for years. He's he's he can handle it. Like he he can go out there, and and he understands professional basketball. He understands how to play. Like he doesn't have to be babied along. I think he, uh, just, just let him go out there and play. Like you're not winning anything in New York this year. Like newsflash, you're not. You're probably you're not getting the playoffs. You're not competing. This guy's your best chance of winning anything in the next ten years. Get him out there and just let him let him play. Let him play twenty seven minutes a night. Let him work. Let him work with with another good player like Mello. Let him develop chemistry with Jerry and Grant. And let this stuff happen. Don't waste time with Derek Williams and bullshit like that. There's no point for it. But it doesn't mean I'm drafting him in. I'm not necessarily drafting him in fantasy leagues though this year. Or would you? Would you look at him in the, in the last round? Yeah, I would. Just because that's sort of the player I'm looking for in the last round. So I mean, here's the thing: is I, I do think that the, he'll start off with sort of like the 20 to 22 minute a night uh, playing time. But Phil Jackson isn't so inflexible. And we're saying Phil Jackson. I guess it's really Derek Fisher, but Phil Jackson isn't so inflexible that if Porzingis plays. Uh, well in those 20 minutes that they bump him to 24 and then bump him to 26 and then 10 games in he's playing fantasy relevant minutes so you know I, I think the what I'm looking for at the end of the draft is a guy that could be really really good or you know I might just have to cut off, off on the waiver wire and the sooner that you can tell the better because you want the roster spot so you can pick up somebody new so yeah I'm willing to draft for Vegas last round see what the first game or two look like if they're sort of promising, hold on to them for a little bit longer and, and see if it goes anywhere. Now, I don't know. I don't know about you, Mark, but in general, when I play my fantasy leagues, probably the first two weeks I lose almost guaranteed because I'm just watching things. I'm not necessarily 
making rushed moves. I'm, I'm watching, how's this guy going? Maybe I'll hold on to him for a week because he's getting limited minutes, but it'll, it'll come up in the next week or so and I'll wear it or I'll, or I'll make a few moves trying to get the right thing happening until I really set into a groove and then, yeah, two weeks in and then I start theoretically mm-hmm. rolling through and smashing yeah, people. But a lot of the times I'll lose three, six and I'll lose four, four, five and then I'll lose four, five again. And then, okay, everything's coming together. I know where things are, things are happening because the first week, especially you get so much variation in percentages. Your percentages are just all over the place. You'll get Andre Drummond hitting 80% of his free throws for the first week and Dirk hitting 30 and you go, what the hell is going on? And then after two weeks, you go, okay, we're back to normal now. But then in that first week, stuff just goes all over the place and you get people making crazy drops and crazy crazy ads and just stupid moves and that's what you got to avoid your only goal in the first week in my opinion is try to make sure you get the guy on the waiver wire who's going to be good next season the the, the draymond green type player yes and don't don't do anything dumb don't don't drop someone don't drop someone um and arrest that's why you, rest decision. you gotta draft uh risky guys at the end of your because if you draft all solid guys so you just pick like the best guy you take Yahoo's rankings or ESPN's rankings and you just draft the top guy every round. Yep. Then and then you have three guys on your bench who are solid guys. You get like 140th best player. Who's like maybe that's David Lee and he's just going to get steady whatever. He's going to produce that sort of 140th value. Then do you like it's hard to drop him after game 2 because you see Draymond Green is getting minutes. But if you draft Porzingis and you see that they're playing in 12 minutes a game, then you go, hey, I don't want Porzingis anymore. I'm getting rid of him. I'm going to pick up Draymond Green. That's completely the right way to go about it because, yeah, you're right. You can get someone who averages 130th rank the whole season, but that's not what you want with that with that mm-hmm. last pick. You want someone who can, you can get there and become a top 60 guy. And you might need to rotate four guys through that position in the first month until you find that right, that right mm-hmm. person who is going to do that. And sometimes you miss, sometimes you hit, but it's what you really need to do because if you don't do it, it's, it's hard to win without getting value. And I always say this, Mark, when you're picking the first two rounds, you just want someone who's not going to not gonna bust. You want, you, want, you want to get someone who is not at a risk of busting because if they're ranked fourth, if they, if they go up and become the first ranked guy, it's not that much of a difference. It's not a big difference. That's but if they, if they completely bust and then become the 30th ranked player, and that's killed you. You just want the guys in the first two rounds to give you the value that you drafted them for. If I picked you fourth, I want you to finish fourth, fifth, sixth, third, seventh, maybe, that sort of range. If I picked you 15th, you need to rank somewhere between 13th and 18th. That's what I want. If I pick you if I pick you 60th, I want you to rank 30th. If I pick you 100th, I want you to rank 60th. If That's I pick you 100th, like I don't want you to rank 100th. It's like Hassan Whiteside in the second round. Exactly, right? because there's a chance if you pick him at pick 20, he ends up at, at 80, and then or, that's killed you. Uh, or 350. Yeah, Larry Sanders style. <laughs> like that's 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 what you've got to avoid. And that's why I'd be avoiding... Like Paul George could be the, a top 20 guy, but there's also a chance that this league really bothers him and he becomes the 50th ranked guy. And I've picked him at pick 19. And that, your season's over. In look, yeah, and then he's healthy. He, go, he goes from 19 to 13. That's not a big jump. When I, if I pick someone else at 19, he goes from 19 to 17. Yeah, I didn't get that jump of six spots, but who cares? I didn't lose i didn't i didn't i managed my risk better and then you take the risk later on and hope for that jimmy butler type jump completely off topic of rotations but yeah that's it let's talk charlotte and their front court mark we yeah. talked the other day how we uh we uh picked frank kaminsky in our dynasty rookie draft and in that uh in that dynasty draft we're actually on the clock for veterans at the moment mark and i'm pretty uh pretty confident we're gonna snatch up kevin durant with pick five yeah speaking yep. of guys who are risky and could ruin your season yeah. We're going to take Kevin Durant at pick five. But the, the thing I'll say there is that we're talking uh, dynasty as well. So we're... The other thing is Kevin Durant could be the best player in fantasy by a mile. Like yes. you're talking risk and reward and, and the risk and reward with Kevin Durant is different because if his injury didn't exist, I would still say he's the top player in fantasy. Yeah, uh, I agree. Regardless of Anthony Davis. And it may not be particularly close. So if you can get a guy who's way better than anybody else in the league at pick five. I mean, at some point you kind of have to, he, he has risk, but you've got to weigh that because he could be so good. And yeah. all the report, all the news we have is positive. Look, and he, he could struggle this season. He could limit a little bit of minutes, could miss some games, but we're also looking at the next five yeah. seasons. And then yeah. we're going to go, okay, I'm more confident of him in the next five seasons. 
Yeah, unless you think his career is over, then then he's yeah, fine with the dynasty. I don't think that. Point. Now, Charlotte. Okay, Frank Kaminsky, Hello. Cody Zeller, Marvin Williams. Um, it is. It's a whole bunch of yuck. They're really Tyler Hansborough. Uh, oh, gee. Spencer Hawes. Okay, so Al Jefferson's going to play the five and Spencer Hawes is going to back him up. I'm pretty sure that's going to... Spencer Hawes at the four last year was doesn't work. not... It wasn't good. It was it was not it good. Um, I'm still really high on Cody Zell. I still think he can develop into a into a decent NBA player. I don't feel he was really given a huge opportunity. And even when he, when he got big minutes, he played generally pretty well. I just mm-hmm. don't feel he was ever given a decent run and Marvin Williams is out there thieving minutes. I don't know why he was doing that. Um, hopefully Cody Zeller is he, he is one of the top. Uh, if you look at like real plus minus, he comes out yep. very high. So he is for all by all sort of measures, a good NBA player that hasn't sort of all the way translated to a fantasy for him, even like yep. on a per possession basis, you know, throw minutes out of the, out for a second and just look at how productive he's been at, at accumulating stats and and that has been a struggle for him and so while i'm with you like i think cody zeller is an interesting nba player i don't sort of think that they've missed necessarily on that pick i'm not sure he's ever going to be the fantasy he, he, he has that fantasy upside to really target it late in draft the other thing he's got going for him from a fantasy point of view is good free throw percentage too which is something that yeah it can yeah. be a real a real good factor for a, for a big man as well um I think he's the better player than what Frank Kaminsky is, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that I think he's going to be the better fantasy. I think if they get equal minutes, Kaminsky is probably going to produce more fantasy wise uh, at this yeah, point. He's going to hit some three pointers, which is going to help him. Um, but really, and he's going to score a little bit better. At least that's how his numbers translate. But otherwise I think, you know, rebounding, they're probably about the same. They're neither of them are big but stills or blocks guys. I mean, You've mentioned a couple of times that we took Kaminsky in a draft. That's sort of a. That doesn't mean I think that either of us think he's going to be a good fantasy no, standard no. league relevant player. This was a very like you have to take a rookie, and yep. uh, the good rookies two of them. are gone. You yeah. have to take so two we, rookies. We were past the point where like the the rookies that you and I felt like were going to be good this season were, and we thought maybe Kaminsky has like a twenty percent chance of being a, a fantasy relevant rookie. And so we'll take him just because there's nobody left. He's someone that we can we can definitely look look at him at the end of a draft, similar to in a Porzingis, because he can go out there. You know, he can hit he could hit a three a game and get ten points and, and six rebounds and you know point mm-hmm. eight blocks and go forty seven and seventy seven from the from the line and from, from the field and from the line and that that can be useful. Don't necessarily think he's really going to blow up and become a, a real big star this year, but it is possible. He's an older guy. He doesn't he's not doesn't have maturity issues. He's a bigger body, a stronger body. It's going to be interesting to see how he goes there. I still think Zala starts over him. I think that Zala starts in Kaminsky, and hopefully it means we just marginalize Marvin Williams and he gets down into into lower teens in minutes. That would be my hope uh, for that. And it says Spencer Hawes limit him to the backup uh, at center. You might also get some Michael Kidd Gilchrist playing some four. That is that is something that'll happen for a percentage of the time that he's on the court. And we talk about guys who you know, like Cody Zeller, who are better NBA players and fantasy players. Michael Kidd Gilchrist is one of those. And it really interests me to see like there was a discussion on Michael Kidd Gilchrist on the uh, fantasy basketball subreddit this week, and and someone had commented just bust. Like, well, he's not a bust. He just doesn't score, and that's not that doesn't that, that's not everything. It's not it's, it's like not even. That. I like him as a stream option. I've used him a lot in head to head leagues, sort of towards yep. the end of the week. Pick him up if you need it. He he, you can target specific categories, even to the point like he's one of the only guys you can pick up and, and sort of try to boost your field goal percentage. He does well at that for a backcourt guy or a, you know a wing guy. He's gonna you know if you need rebounds out of like the the wing position, he's he does okay there. He's not gonna kill you anywhere. Like he's gonna get kind of enough of the other stats. The defensive stats are sort of there. So I, I like to stream him just because he, he's not going to come in and hurt you anywhere, and, and you can have him help you in a, a few specific spots. He's a guy for me that's on my list of of potential breakout guys. So he's not going to score, but if he gets one and a half steals, 1.1 1. 1 blocks, eight rebounds, 48 and, and 75%, that's a top 100 sort of guy there, yeah, especially in a situation if you're punting points and he only gets you 9, 10 points. Those mm-hmm. other numbers can be real, look for, especially for uh, a small for, forward. You know, sort of. Yeah, yeah. so he, he could be the guy that you, you pick at pick 140 and he becomes the, the, the guy ranked 80th. 
So, so I, I would think he's in charge. Amino for... over him. Would you take Amino over him? Yeah, I mean, yes, I would. Uh, Amino has the ability to go twenty rebounds, three blocks, three steals. Where I don't necessarily think Kid Gilchrist has that has that here's in the, him to do that. Here's the last thing I would say about Kid Gilchrist is we know that not this past off season, but the last off season, he worked on fixing his shot with Mark Price. And from everything I've, you know, it's sort of the research I've looked at. When you undergo a, a fix of your your jump shot, you don't see it in the first year; you see it in the second year. So yep. that's not not anything I'm projecting, but like that's something I'm watching this year. Of he's had like a full off season, season and off season to to fix his jumper. Like if it's ever going to be fixed, I think it's this off season or it excuse looked, me, this, looked, this regular season. It looked better last season. He shot forty post All Star. He shot forty eight percent. Quick question for you, Mark: How many three pointers did Michael Kidd Gilchrist make last season? Ooh, I could tell you. Let me. Don't don't, don't look at uh, it. I want me to guess. guess. Yep. Um, zero. How many did he, did he attempt? <laughs> Nine. Zero. Oh my gosh! Really? It, it, he he played the three and did not attempt one three pointer, and that's odd in this era of the NBA. But it's also a guy that knows his limitations, and for fantasy, that's great because he hit forty eight percent of his shots by shooting what he knows he can hit, and that's that's. Yeah. That's the anti Tony Roten, <laughs> and that's fine. I, I don't, you know what? He can't shoot, and he knows he can't shoot, but he knows what he can hit, and he hits them, and that is literally all you need from a from a fantasy point of view. It does help hurt them a bit in spacing, but adding Batum and adding Kaminsky either side of him is is going to help that out. Yeah, let's, I agree. Uh, let's this this question here came to me from uh from david jones who's uh one of the red rock listeners in the kendall gill division of the red rock listener league and he's this is a question this is for very deep leagues mark so we won't spend a huge amount of time on it but it's more uh more australian centric he says for all us aussies can you maybe discuss matthew delavid over's role now that mo williams is at the Cavs? if you have time um some people are going to be interested in mo williams's value because he was a great pickup last season when rubio went down okay I'll give you my quick thought on it. Nadella Vadova just gets completely marginalized here. He will, he, yeah, yeah, he was fantastic. He was a great story for a couple of games in the playoffs, but he's not that good. He's not going to, he's not going to be playing above Mo Williams. Mo Williams was fantastic in Minnesota. He was fantastic in Charlotte, and he's going to be a great option in Cleveland. He's going to also allow Cleveland to cut back on Kyrie Irving's minutes by a couple, which we saw that they, they did come out and say, we want to, we want to reduce Irving's minute load. He played 36 minutes last season, and he could, you know, theoretically come down to 34 or 33 and let Williams play 22, 23 minutes, either next to him and and behind behind Curry. So Mo Williams is probably not going to be standard league relevant, but there will be times when Irving misses, you're going to definitely have to look at Mo Williams in that sort of situation. How do you see it? Yeah, I am sort of the same way. I, I still think, you know, even if James and Kyrie Irving get big minutes, we know there's a lot of, there's a lot of front court depth on that team, but... I could still see Mo Williams getting, say, 24 minutes a game yep. uh, in the games that he plays, which, you know, he's he's sort of injury prone. He's going to set out a little bit. I think Deladova, Deladova, who, you know, has missed some time in his in his career as well, I think he could sort of settle in at like the 20-minute range, 20-minute per game range. That's not going to be standard league relevant. Uh, if you play in a really deep league, he could maybe provide some value, though. Next one I had down on this list to talk about was the Dallas Mavericks. And look, their their starting lineup is pretty locked in. It's Darren Williams, Wes Matthews, Chandler Parsons, Dirk Nowitzki, and Zaza Pachulia. But Chandler Parsons is coming back from a mystery knee injury. Wes McKillies is Wes McKillies. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Where it's late. Wes Matthews is coming back from a torn Achilles. Now, he he states that he is going to be ready to play on opening night. And you know what? I'll believe it when I see it. He might play, but he also might play 20 minutes. So someone, maybe for the first month of the season, is going to have to step in. Now, there's two candidates for that. Devin Harris or rookie Justin Anderson. Which one do you... And I would, I would like throw there? in uh, John Jenkins right now, too. Yeah, you, um, I don't, you like John Jenkins. I don't necessarily like him that much um but you're right here's here's an option because they don't have many other options who who do you and say t- an taking a risk on so, or, yeah jj Barrera you know, as well when when i see a situation like this where there's just no information and you know with rick carlisle there's not going to be any information you yep. sort of like assume that they're going to play about the same amount of minutes uh you know like so i projected devin harris 
to get 24 minutes, John Jenkins to get 24 minutes. And I guess I like Justin Anderson slightly more to get more minutes. I've got him at 26 minutes. From a fantasy standpoint, the only one that sort of approaches relevance in that in that sort of a time split would be Jenkins. And what, why why do you see him approaching relevance in, in that sense in, in 24 minutes? It's because of his three-pointers, correct? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Justin Anderson, I mean, he projects to, to make, uh, you know, two or two and a half times as many three-pointers per possession as Justin Anderson. Um, his, stills, his still rate has been fairly good. He actually scores at a pretty good clip. Um, his percentages are, are fine. Uh, and we know that rookies struggle with a lot of those type of things. So I think, you know, I'm interested to see what, who Justin Anderson is. I think he's probably a better player sort of in the long term. I think Dallas even gives him more minutes. So if you're going for like a, a strictly upside type play, like you don't believe Wesley Matthews is coming back uh, so well, maybe he's the guy to go with. But if you're looking like in a deep league and you just want a, a, a value guy, I think John Jenkins could be good head. Uh, I don't know, 16 team league value until we know that Wes Matthews is back. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree with that. I think if you're in a, in a 12 team or 14 team league, you'd be pretty safe grabbing Jenkins with your last pick. I don't think many people are going to be looking to grab him there, but he could chime in for a month and hit two threes a game. And that, that can be valuable to get you a bit of a head start in that category um, and, and really boost you up. And then you have no qualms about just kicking his ass to the sidelines when uh, right. when Matthews is back to full strength. You don't need to hold on to John Jenkins for you know his tremendous upside, whereas Anderson yeah, he has a lot more longer-term value, maybe not this season, but I, I do really like what Justin Anderson can do. Um, we touched on this team a little bit earlier, Mark, when we talked about poor organizations, and that's the Sacramento Kings. There's a couple of positions that are sort of up for debate here. Um, we know that Rajon Rondo is going to be given the starting role and how long he holds that for is something that is not necessarily locked in stone because he has been in a little bit combustible. Um, Rudy Gay is going to be the small forward, and he is consistently underrated to me in, in fantasy leagues. And Demarcus Cousins is going to be one of the big men, whether it's the, the five or the, or the four. Those are the two positions, the, the shooting guard and the other big man there is, is where we sort of don't know. Now, I, I think that Ben McLemore is going to be the focus of them in the backcourt, but there's a lot of other options they can go with. They can play Darren Collison at the two. They can play newly signed Marco Ballinelli there as well. Um, do those two cut into McLemore's minutes enough where you, you think that he should be avoided in standard leagues or are you, are you excited about McLemore heading into his third season? Or are you still there? Maybe you're not, not there anymore. Cool. I'll keep talking then. Um, I think that McLemore is, is a guy who's going to have you know, some, some pretty good value at, at that position. He really started to come on at the end of last season. Um, they did invest a pretty high pick in, uh, on him, a top 10 pick. He can rebound the ball. He can he can shoot. He can he can score. He can get some decent steal numbers. I think that Ben McLemore is going to be a guy that you want to look to at the end of your draft. Bellinelli is not going to be a standard league guy, I don't think. Um, Darren Collison is an interesting one, though. I'd be happy taking a little bit of a risk on him towards the end of a draft because, as I said, he can play the two. He's going to play back up one. He could get 25, 26 minutes a night, and that wouldn't be a surprise. And he could also take over from Rajon Rondo at some point, and that definitely wouldn't be a surprise because we know that, that Rondo has struggled not only in his attitude but in his play the last couple of places. Mark, I believe you're back. You dropped out there for a little bit. Are you there? No, he's gone again. The other position that's interesting to me is the the other big man role. So Costa Kufos and rookie Willie Cauley Stein are the two options there. I think it's going to be Kufos that plays next to Cousins. I don't think that Cauley Stein is going to get a very big role. We know that his offense struggles. He's going to be a great defender. He's going to get a lot of blocks. He's going to get some pretty decent steal numbers. But I don't think his minutes are going to be up there enough to be locked in as a real standard league value guy for a big chunk of the season, let alone most of it. So he's not someone that I'm going to be looking at. Yeah, again, after pick 100, that's fine. Take a last round flyer on him. But I think Kufos is going to get the bulk of the minutes. And that's not necessarily going to translate into fantasy value for Costa Kufos, unfortunately. Uh, unfortunately for him, we just don't know. We don't know what he's going to be able to produce next to Cousins. And I think that I think the problem is going to be... Um, just the, the minutes for Cauley Stein, it's not going to be there. He'll probably play low 20s. It might increase towards the end of the season, but we know rookie big men just don't play uh, don't play decent minutes. And that's I think that's going to translate to Cauley Stein even more than what it does for some of the other guys. 
Mark, do we have you back now? No, still no Mark. All right, that's cool. The other position I really wanted to touch on today, which I did want to get Mark's thoughts on because he keeps dropping out. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if it's him or me that's dropping out. But Mark, if you are there, just uh, just chime in and say hello. Uh, we want to talk about the Utah Jazz and their point guard position. We knew that Dante Exum was going to be locked in at that position for the season, but he has torn his ACL, so he will be out for the, for the season. So they don't know what they're doing at this point. We haven't heard an announcement of who's starting. There's Trey Burke, who's an option. He generally sucks. He was okay coming off the bench last season. So when, he re- when Exum replaced him in the starting lineup, Trey Burke came off the bench. He scored all right, got some decent assist numbers, hit some threes, shot poorly, but he was still useful. And I think he can still be useful. His upside is not great because I just don't think he's a really great player. But he's going to be interesting. Now, the, the name that's sort of coming out of, not necessarily out of the blue, but it's coming out now is Raul Nito, uh, a, a rookie who was drafted, not this season, a few seasons ago, uh, a point guard from Brazil is coming across, a really long point guard, which Trey Burke isn't. He's a decent defender, which Trey Burke isn't. He's, he's a bigger sort of guy, more in the Dante Exum mold. And they might want to use Raul Nito there at some point this season. It probably won't be to start the season. The other guy that's of interest to me is Alec Burks, who you know, most likely will start at the two, but could also start at the one. And I think that's putting Alec Burks at the one, that would leave more minutes open for Rodney Hood to play at the two, who I think is going to be a really interesting player this season. That's that's an interesting way to go about it. If I'm taking one of these guys, Alec Burks, Raul Nito, or Trey Burke at the end of the draft, Al- Alec Burks is the first guy I look for. I take Trey Burke next, and I take Raul Nito last, and probably not at all. As much as he might be a starter, I just don't know how much he's going to be able to contribute for fantasy leagues this season. That's the way that I would look at uh, look the way at that at that situation. Unfortunately, Mark is having issues rejoining us here, so I think we might uh, might end the podcast now. That was basically all we needed to to uh, to cover off in today's show. Um, try and get him back on as I as I wrap things up. Just remember, if you are listening to this podcast, which if you heard me say that, you obviously are. Don't forget to subscribe and head across to iTunes and leave a review for the podcast. Just you know, give give me four or five stars. That would be awesome if you could do that. Leave some words, and that encourages, uh, lets people know that you like the show, gets it up there in the iTunes rankings, get it out to more people. Really helps with getting sponsors on board and getting yeah, you know, help support myself and, and and the show and everything happening. And I always appreciate everybody who has done that and everybody who is planning to do that in the future. That is always fantastic. On YouTube, head across and subscribe there because everyone who watches on YouTube, that also helps support the podcast. Every every watch on there helps with um, with money coming into the show also, so I do appreciate that as well. Um, again, a big thank you if you are listening on Hardwood Paroxysm. It's great to have you guys listening, uh, listening to the show and hopefully you're enjoying it as well. And don't forget that the Team Preview podcast series does kick off in a couple of days when I'm going to be talking with Austin Peters regarding the Boston Celtics and what we, me and Mark discussed it for a bit today, but you're going to get another thought on it with Austin's thoughts, uh, thoughts in a couple of days. Really, really breaking down the Boston Celtics with none of this other interference from other teams as we really get into all things green with the Celtics and Austin. Follow me on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, all those great places. You know where to find me. Please head across and also you know, send me any questions you want and I'm happy to answer them uh, whenever I get the opportunity and I'm pretty interactive with most of you guys. Try to get back to nearly all of your questions as best that I can. Mark, we'll try it one more time. Are you there? I am here. Mark, I've just finished wrapping up the show, but you're back, but that's fantastic. Um Anything that you wanted to add about anything before we uh, before we close off here? No, uh, you, it seemed like you handled Sacramento pretty well. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I I covered Utah as well, but you uh, you weren't around. But that's okay. Have you got anything to add on the Utah point guard situation? Um, I mean, I think the guy you go with for now is uh, is Trey Burke. I think he could lose his job to Raul Howell Meadow, or maybe they go with uh, you know. Gordon Hayward was basically the point guard last year. So they can go with Hayward, the, Hayward can get six assists a game if he's handling the ball a lot. Yeah. I think he's the point guard next year, whether that means they play Burke as the de facto point guard or whether they play Alec Burks or whether they play Rodney Hood. They could go a lot of different ways. Yeah, I think that the, the biggest winner from the injury to me to, to Exum is Rodney Hood because it opens up more minutes for him because it allows Alec Burks to slide mm-hmm. to point guard more and it allows more for Rodney Hood. And I think Rodney Hood has got a chance to be really, really big this year and the opportunity is opening up. I think he can be massive this season. Hopefully his foot holds up. 
I think he can be really, really big this year. Mark, when can everyone, uh, where can everyone find you on Twitter? You can look for me on Twitter at Mark F. Roberts. Mark is spelled with a C. Mark is spelled with a C. So make sure you head across and follow Mark there. And as I mentioned, follow me on Twitter. Mark, thank you for coming on to the, to the show again. That's twice in a week. I feel uh, excessively blessed. <laughs> that's one way to look at it. Thanks for having me on, Josh. No problem. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Bye.